Hello everyone and welcome to Andy's Witchcraft. I hope you're all having a wonderful day so far um, and enjoying the last bit of summer in the northern hemisphere that we are going to experience for a while. <laughs> uh, today I decided that it was time for me to get a little bit personal because I feel like during the, the past few months of doing this podcast, um, I was very much not personal. <laughs> I feel like it was very much me just lecturing on facts with the little bits and pieces of my experiences, but nothing really too deep. And I decided that I want this podcast to be a deep. I want this to be a reflection on my journey and help inspire others who may be going through similar things. And, this, and so when brainstorming topics for this week, I decided to go with something that uh, I have been holding myself accountable to um, for the past four months. Yeah, four months. And that, that is my journey of sobriety. Um, now, I decided to go sober from alcohol and drugs on April 20th of this year. Um, and it's not for the reasons that you think. Most people, when they think of someone going sober, it's because of addiction. And I am not an addict. Um, and now I know what you're saying. Some addicts do say that, but I mean it. I'm not. I've always been in control of my substance use. I've only been tipsy or drunk once in my entire life. Um, and the one time that I was tipsy led me to the reality that even if you are careful with your actions, even if you're careful with who you're around, and even if you're careful with the amount of alcohol that you are consuming, others may still use it to their own advantage to manipulate and deceive you. Um, but still, uh, after that experience, even with that knowledge, I drank carefully. I had one or two uh, alcoholic drinks, um, at special occasions and parties, which I didn't go to often, like barely every month. Um, and so when researching Buddhism, um, I found out that a lot of Buddhists do go sober and it's because being intoxicated does not allow them to experience mindfulness, um, which if you're not a mindful person and you're not reflecting constantly um, of your life and your actions, uh, and if you're not in control or knowledgeable of your actions, because some people who are blackout drunk will not remember the actions that they did. Um, and how can you be mindful of your actions if you can't even remember doing the things that you do? So when reading about that, I kind of got inspired. Um, because I mostly drank on occasion to fit in. You know, anytime someone would message me telling me they got drunk, I knew it was a normal thing that everybody did at one point of their life, but I would still be filled with anxiety. And I wasn't really sure why, you know, it's like it's their life and I've always been the person not to judge and I never did judge them, but I was scared for them and I was scared of who they were around and what other people would do. Um, and so even if I knew they were safe and with people who would protect them, I still worried. And so when I'm reading about this on Buddhism and monks being sober and all that, uh, I, I heard a voice in the back of my mind and it's not in a uh, delusional voice or hallucination. It really felt like an intuitive voice in the back of my mind. And they were telling me, child, I think you are ready. And when I heard that and felt that voice, I asked, you know, ready for what? Like I had no idea and I got zero reply. Moments later, that is when uh, the article popped up about how Buddhist monks abstain from alcohol due to the rules that Buddha put out about the mindfulness and all that. And when that article popped up, um, I did more research on it. And I knew that this was what the voice meant. You know, like two seconds ago, a voice was telling me that I'm ready. And then I, this article pops up. Um, and I knew who it was, who that voice was, that intuitive voice within and around me kind of thing. I knew it was the Buddha. And originally I wanted to do this temporarily. Uh, I was like, okay, yeah, this is a temporary fast from alcohol for 30 days, sort of how like Christians do Lent. Um, and I wanted to fast from alcohol as a contemplative journey to kind of note down my actions how is my life without alcohol how how do i feel do i feel like i belong still and if i didn't feel like i belonged why 
why did it, why did I feel this sense of isolation and um, separation from the rest of the world? And I received signs through tarot and other divinatory methods that this was to be sort of like a trial period of sobriety. But after a couple of weeks, I saw intense changes in myself. I no longer felt anxious about thoughts of alcohol or thoughts of my friends getting drunk. Um, and I let go of that situation of betrayal that I experienced when I got tipsy my first and only time. And I even managed to forgive the person who betrayed me. My depressive episodes also became fewer. Uh, I stopped having anxiety attacks, basically uh, surrounding alcohol. Of course, I still get depressed and I still get anxious. Uh, I'm not saying going sober cures depression and cures anxiety. Absolutely does not. And I still go through that. But they become easier to manage. Way easier to manage. And it was weird to me, like, why? Because I, I only drink, like I said, like once a month, barely. And so, like, why would this reduction of alcohol for once a month change this? But it did. And I, I can't explain it, even if I tried. But I think it was being devoted to a cause, devoted to my spirituality, being a Buddhist, a crystal pagan Buddhist, and knowing that I was doing this for my guides and for myself. And that devotion gave me a sense of purpose. The purpose was to be mindful of not only myself but others and to help others learn to be mindful whether they are sober or not you can still be mindful even if you drink even if you know even if you drink more often than I did I still believe you can be mindful um, so long as you're not in addiction because the moment you fall into addiction um, that's the moment where you lose control and you're not mindful anymore you're not mindful of your actions or what you do um, but other than that, I completely believe that people who drink on occasion or, or who are in control of their drinking can be mindful. And I want to inspire others to do that. I just find it easier being sober to, to be able to teach. And from that moment on, I knew that what I thought was going to be a temporary decided to be a vow for what I hope to be the rest of my life because it changed my life for the better. And I am inspired and I have never felt closer to Buddha than what, than you know, when I got, when I decided to be sober, that was the moment that I feel like Buddha is always watching over me and making sure that I am following the eightfold path and the four noble truths that he set out. Now, a note again, the things in this video are purely testimonial. There will be a few facts about sobriety and Buddhism and sobriety in the Bible and all that. Um, but from personal opinions and experiences, anything that's not fact, which you can tell based on research, this is my testimony. I went sober again for my own reasons that were physical, mental, and spiritual. And I am in no way, no way trying to force anyone that they have to go sober to be a good witch or Christian or Buddhist. In fact, what you're going to see in the next sections of this video is that drinking alcohol can be in, in moderation, be good to celebrate and heal and express thanks to God and the universe and your deities. Drinking alcohol can be a celebration, but it has to be, you have to be in control. You have to realize you control the alcohol, not the other way around. So, with that being said, let's talk about what my spiritualities have to say about drugs and sobriety. So I started off with my story began with learning about sobriety and Buddhism. So let's talk about some facts. Buddhists have five precepts that the Buddha asked his lay disciples to follow. The first one, I observe the precept of abstaining from killing living beings. This means not intentionally causing the death of any living beings. The second, I observe the precept of abstaining from stealing. This means not taking things that do not belong to us. Third, I observe the precept of abstaining from sexual misconduct. This means not having sexual relations with people who we are not, um, who do not have, who we do not have their consent. People, so basically having sexual relations against their will. The fourth, I observe the precept of abstaining from telling lies. This means saying what is true at the proper time. And fifth, 
I observed the precept of abstaining from using intoxicating drinks and drugs. By following this precept, we are committed to having a clear mind at all times. Now, I read you the five precepts um, that we are asked to follow. So let's talk about the fifth precept because that's what this episode is all about. And so the first question you may ask, okay, intoxicating drinks and drugs. What are intoxicants? Um, Intoxicants in Buddhism and health sciences are defined as anything we ingest, inhale, or inject into our system that distort consciousness, disrupt self-awareness, and that are detrimental to health. While the phrasing in Pali undoubtedly refers to alcohol, beliefs about whether this precept allows for any form of alcohol consumption or drug use differs depending on the school of Buddhism that you are a part of and even between teachers. So everyone basically has a different opinion. It doesn't mean you can't drink alcohol at all. It doesn't mean you just can't be intoxicated. And if you are intoxicated, when is that? Is it the moment you have no self-awareness is it the moment that you can't walk straight what is it because of these differences um and because of ingrained cultural habits of social drinking the association of alcohol with the good life and all of that jazz the fifth precept is often not followed to the letter and so most buddhists do not abstain completely from alcohol they moderate their drinking they may they will not have they most of them won't have an alcoholic drink like every day, but every once in a blue moon, yeah, they'll, they'll have one, especially for celebrations. The Buddha, in one of the Jataka tales about his past lives, mints no words when describing the effects of drunkenness. And this is what the Buddha said. He said, the one who drinks this brew will sin in thought, word, and deed. He will see good as evil and evil as good. Even the most modest person will act indecently when drunk. The wisest man will babble foolishly. You will grow accustomed to evil behavior, to lies, to abuse, to filth, and to disgrace. So, many Mahayana Buddhist schools and teachers today maintain that it is intoxication of the mind that violates the precept, not drinking itself per se. So, for example, taking medicines containing alcohol and eating food made with trace amounts of alcohol are not considered violations in any Buddhist schools because unless abused and unless it affects your actions and your self-awareness, they do not cause intoxication. And so you could still follow the Buddhist precept even when drinking small amounts of alcohol. Similarly, neither does eating food flavored with small amounts of liquor violate this precept. Some teachers, especially Zen Buddhists, understand the fifth precept to mean refraining from any addictive or compulsive behaviors that intoxicates the mind. This includes pornography, gambling, shopping, overeating, excessive exercise, unskillful use of the internet, and overconsumption of TV and other media. So basically anything, again, that you are out of control, that you cannot control and you are not aware of, that is what is going against this precept. Not drinking alcohol itself. So a lot of people ask, why was this fifth precept made? You know, like, why does it matter? Um, And I want to look at the Four Noble Truths, which are the four overarching guidelines that the Buddha set out um, about life, basically. They're kind of like, quote unquote, common knowledge that Buddhists have about life. And once you are aware of this, you can overcome it and hopefully reach enlightenment. So the first one is the truth of suffering. And this is the simple truth that suffering exists through addiction. The second, the truth of the cause of suffering. So the result of their thirst or craving. So using drugs or alcohol to escape suffering in of itself causes suffering. Here, the addict learns to look inward rather than outward to find happiness. The third, the truth of the end of suffering. Here, the addict finds hope. The Buddha taught that cravings 
only end through hard work. But the end of suffering is possible. And then the fourth, the truth of the path that frees us from suffering. The Buddha emphasized the importance of living in a way that makes you healthy and safe. And by doing this, you can bring the end of suffering. So as you can see, uh, the story of addiction and going sober and reaching mindfulness is in the Four Noble Truths. And it's for that reason that the Buddha set out this precept to avoid intoxicants. So now I want to talk about alcohol in the Bible. And the interesting thing is that there's no mention of being sober in the Bible. <laughs> alcohol is everywhere. The importance, the spiritual importance of alcohol is very apparent in the Bible. From the moment that Jesus um, mixed the, the, um, the wine and water to make the blood of Christ. From that moment, we knew that alcohol played an imperative role in Christianity and in the Bible. And even for, actually, I lied. From the moment Jesus performed his first ever miracle, <laughs> which you will see um, in one of the verses that follow. So why don't we get to the Bible verses involving alcohol? The first is Genesis chapter 27, verse 28. May God give you the dew of heaven and of the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine. The second, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 23. Stop drinking only water and use a little wine because of your stomach and your frequent illnesses. The third, Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 7. Go, eat your food with gladness and drink your wine with a joyful heart, for God has already approved what you do. The fourth, Amos chapter 9, verse 14. I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel, and they shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink their wine, and they shall make gardens and eat their fruit. The fifth, John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee, and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. The sixth verse, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with spirit. Proverbs chapter 23, verses 29 through 35. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has strife? Who has complaining? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? Those who tarry long over wine, those who go to try mixed wine, do not look at wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup and goes down smoothly. In the end, it bites like a serpent and stings like an adder. Your eyes will see strange things and your heart utter perverse things. Isaiah chapter 5 verse 11. Woe to those who rise early in the morning that they may run after strong drink, 
who tarry late into the evening as wine inflames them. Romans chapter 14, verse 21. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. And the last one, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 15. Woe to him who makes his neighbors drink. You pour out your wrath and make them drunk in order to gaze at their nakedness. Now, in general, these verses show that drinking in and of itself is not a sin. And actually, it is a God-given blessing. It is something God blessed us, a gift you can consider. But it can be spiritually dangerous depending on intent. So, nothing is wrong with alcohol per se. But it is when you, f you become intoxicated and out of control and you are no longer aware of your intent, why am I drinking, that it becomes an issue. Christians are allowed by God to drink alcohol, but we are forbidden from getting drunk because of the fact that we are no longer in control of our actions at that point. So, in conclusion, you don't have to be sober, just don't get drunk. <laughs> So now I want to finish off this episode with how to know if sobriety is for you. Um, and this is how a kind of like steps that I took to acknowledge if sobriety was for me. And I didn't meet all of these like quote unquote criteria. Um, but this is kind of like based on the internet, based on my knowledge of psychology, how to know if it is for you. Um, and so let's get started. So the first one and the most obvious one is you do not feel forced to be sober. Studies show that those forced into sobriety relapse quicker and more often than those who choose to be sober of their own free will. Never force yourself to be part of any treatment that you do not need or want to be part of. If you're going to do it, do it for yourself and not for others. Number two, you feel called to do it for spiritual or meditative practices. So this can include you feel called by one of your spirits to do so, you feel like sobriety can help with your spiritual growth, or you acknowledge that sobriety can help to one, evoke memories which are essential for healing trauma, doing shadow work, or releasing the past. Two, raise your vibrations, which again, help uncover and release negative or lower energies. Three, increase awareness. If you are not sober, you might not be aware of the things and, and the ways in which these energies are affecting you, but sobriety allows you to take notes of these toxic environments, and you can begin to sense the difference between high and low energy, which can then allow you to set boundaries. And four, protect your spirit. Sobering up can protect yourself against a malevolent spirit or low energies. And when under the, the influence of substances, we are most vulnerable to a spiritual attack. Um, and so sobriety keeps our spiritual gifts sharp and they can act as a shield during meditation. So these are ways that you can feel called to do it for a spiritual practice. So not for your physical health or like because you're an, you're an addict. But if you want to do it to get closer to the universe spiritually, you can. Again, you do not have to. There are plenty of ways to get close to the universe and feel connected to the earth and all that without being sober. But if you feel like sobriety is affecting if sobriety is for you and drinking alcohol is affecting your health, then maybe this is a sign that you can consider this. Um, for me, like I said, I stayed sober after a spiritual awakening I experienced and it went from a temporary period of sobriety to something I want to do for the rest of my life. So it was a spiritual reason and a meditative practice that made me decide to go sober. The third sign that sobriety may be for you is that you feel like drugs and alcohol control you rather the, than the other way around. Again, the moment you feel out of control, that is a sign that there is some things you need to reconsider of your life. Um, especially because you can then, number four, 
feel symptoms of addiction, which can include withdrawal, habituation, powerful cravings, and inability to stop using, or physical impacts to your health. So that is all I have for this episode. Um, I really, really hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you guys enjoyed getting a closer look to my life. Um, A quick, I guess like, update how am i four months into sobriety i do not regret my decision i get offered alcohol very often by family members um, and i'm not afraid to say no and i refuse it and you know i don't feel any less valid in my being for it and every time i say no to alcohol i could feel buddha like patting me on the back being like good job good job (laughs) and it just feels great to have him with me Um, Because sometimes I do feel like because I prioritize God over all else, because that's my personal spiritual practice, I do feel like I neglect Buddha sometimes. Even though I know by following the Eightfold Path and Four Noble Truths, I'm not neglecting him and I'm following what he preached. Still, it feels nice to do something that was encouraged by him. And it feels nice to see that he is still my spirit guide and he still respects me even if I worship a god. Um, And he still believes that I can find a way to enlightenment um, in that sense. So it it, it has been a journey and I am feeling great about it. And maybe I'll make an episode updating on my practice in another four months or something like that if that's what you guys want to hear. Um, or maybe do a Q&A about it. I think that'd be cool to do a Q&A episode. So if that's something you're interested in, uh, shoot me an email um, or uh, put it in the, the Google form in the link tree uh, link. Um, put it in under video ideas. Put in a Q&A session about my journey of sobriety and I will totally do it. So that is it for everything. Um, You can follow me on social media to keep up with my journey. Um, I also update on like if there's a a break in the podcast for whatever reason. I post all about it on my social media. Um, And so that is my Instagram at Andy's Witchcraft. My Tumblr at Sacred Mood Divination. And my TikTok also at Sacred Moon Divination. You could also um, follow the link tree a link click on it and you could join the the discord server i have uh the crystal caverns um and i also post updates every once in a while there i try not to do it too much because it is meant to be a server um for all witches and it's not just something i do to promote my podcast or anything like that um but every once in a while if i feel like it's been a while since i mentioned my podcast i will post an update or two about it so you could follow uh that there And join a community of like-minded witches and even witches of different paths and hear different opinions and open your mind to different journeys. Uh, We'd love to have you there. Um, And that's all I have to tell you. Uh, Blessed be everyone. Have a wonderful day, week, month, and year.